Uh, so I'd like to invite to the floor Jess Moore, who is a founding member of Stop CSG Illawarra. She's a regional spokesperson for the Lockwood Gate Alliance. Uh, Jess really is one of the major drivers in this campaign, and I, it really should be mentioned that Jess uh, and Chris Williams, put your hand up, Chris, wherever you are. It's the wrong way. He's, he's here somewhere. Um, they made a deliberate decision some time back to spend, I don't know what it works out, at half of their waking time to make this program work. Um, and that is a massive contribution. And my take on that, they're the people that we refer to or should refer to as community assets or community treasures. Yes, more. simply is not the case. The reality is this campaign has enormous breadth and depth in this community and what we've been able to do is only because of the large number of people who put out, put in varying amounts of time, some enormous amounts of time, some who have very busy lives and still make time to help out. And that's the reason that this campaign is so strong. I just want to thank Mark and Lyle for welcoming us to country and acknowledge the traditional owners and thank Gordon for welcoming us to the town hall. Now I just want to start by explaining very basically what coal sand gas mining is. So coal sand gas is usually methane. It's trapped in coal seams by water pressure. So to get the gas out, you have to extract the water, at which point the gas migrates to the surface. It's a type of unconventional gas, like shale or tight gas. Now conventional gas, which has been around for a long time and mined in commercial quantities, is contained in porous interconnected reservoirs that are highly permeable, which simply means it allows the gas to flow freely in the rock and also out through the well. However, unconventional gas reserves, including coal seam gas, are in rocks of low permeability. In other words, gas doesn't flow freely in the rock or out of the wells. In economic terms, the key difference between conventional and unconventional natural gas is the manner, ease and cost associated with extraction. Technological breakthroughs in the last decade, two decades, a combination of horizontal drilling, dewatering the coal seam and hydraulic fracturing or fracking have made unconventional gas commercially viable. That's why we're in the situation that we're in. That's why we're seeing such a large expansion of the industry. What I, what I want to do now is, is go through some of the concerns and incidents when it comes to coal seam gas and explain the campaign goals in this context. Uh, funnily enough, I'm, like Rob, I'm very comfortable talking in front of large groups of people and I talk a lot about coal seam gas but I feel quite nervous today because I feel this immense weight of responsibility to accurately reflect the facts, to accurately reflect the situation that we're in and do it justice. Because in and of itself, um, it frightens the hell out of me. And <laughs> so sometimes I get worried that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna explain well enough uh, exactly the situation that we're in, but I'll do my best. So the first issue, and the biggest issue particularly for this region, is water. Water for a number of reasons. First of all, water contamination. So all coal seam gas mining involves the extraction of water from the coal seam. You have to dewater the coal seam to get access to the gas. Now that water is highly saline, so high in salt, it's high in methane, and it can contain a number of toxic and radioactive compounds and heavy metals. So immediately when you're mining for coal seam gas through any extraction technique, you have contaminated water. Secondly, uh, with coal seam gas mining, many of the drilling techniques, particularly hydraulic fracturing, involve the direct contamination of large quantities 
of water. So just to point to the main contaminant, which is salt. Salt which sounds innocuous enough, but salt which kills the productive quality of the land. The Federal Government's Water Group estimates that 150 million tonnes of salt will be produced over the next 30 years by the coal sand gas mining industry. Queensland Gas Company, owned by British Gas, recently received approval to build a salt pit the size of four MCGs. Santos considered dumping at sea and taking to a waste facility, but found it would require 200 tankers operating 24 hours a day, each travelling a distance of 500 kilometres. They ruled it out for economic reasons. The Queensland Government has asked the industry to come up with a salt plan by 2013. So while the industry is operating, while the industry is producing this waste, there is not yet a plan in place to know how to deal with it. This is a photograph of the Pilliga scrub, often referred to as the lungs of New South Wales, where coal sand gas mining is going ahead. Soil testing in the Pilliga found arsenic, lead, chromium, salts and petrochemicals had leaked from CSG water storage areas. That's an unlined evaporation pond in the Pilliga scrub. That's where produced water drilling fluids are sitting. Another example of how the industry is operating. Origin Energy and Conoco Phillips released wastewater into the Condamine River. It was water that had been treated with reverse osmosis, so it had removed the salt and some other contaminants. But it still contained unsafe levels of cyanide, chloroform, lead, boron, aluminium, mercury, silver, chlorine, I won't keep going, 17 chemicals at levels considered to be toxic. Up to eight Olympic swimming pools every day. Here are two photographs of well blowouts. So that is a combination of fracking fluids, produced water and methane spewing up into the air. One is in Dalby in Queensland, one is in Camden, just west of us, in New South Wales. Now dealing with this contaminated water is an enormous issue. How do you dispose of it? One is reverse osmosis, and I've just put up there a picture of a reverse osmosis plant. The other, at the moment, is evaporation ponds, sumps, tanks, so storage on site. Um, and lastly, and this has been done more in the US to date than here, re-injection back into the ground, which I'll talk more about later. Now obviously, um, these pose enormous risks. And, and look, uh, one of the, the key things is just what a great user of water the CSG industry is. So the Federal Government's Water Group estimates that every year the coal sand gas industry will use 5,400 of gigalitres of water. Now to put that into perspective, every year entire domestic use of water in Australia is 1,872 gigalitres. So domestic water use, 1,872 gigalitres. Use by the CSG industry will be 5,400 gigalitres per year. An enormous use of fresh water. In a country like Australia where we regularly go into drought, that's the kind of quantities of water we're going to be looking at treating. Next and finally when it comes to water, it's important to talk about aquifers and underground water systems. So when you drill for coal seam gas, you're often drilling through our underground water systems. Coal seams themselves are often aquifers, and it almost goes without saying that if you are drawing water out of the ground, which you have to do to access the gas, you are depleting underground water systems. Ross Dunn from the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, so the peak body um, representing coal seam gas, told a public meeting, drilling will, to varying degrees, impact on adjoining aquifers. The CSIRO has explained that the relationship between aquifers is unknown. In a paper published by the Queensland Department of Mines and Energy in 2006, Jeff Edwards wrote, no one can realistically know in advance what will happen and what hydraulic connections with other aquifers will appear once the coal seams are dewatered. So what we are talking about is an enormous unknown while drilling is happening. What is known is that if we take large volumes of groundwater out, 
we deplete them. We know that we change the mass, stress and chemical balances of underground systems and that there is a risk of losing clean water into deep water, into deep water coal seams. Obviously when you take the water out of there, it replenishes where does it come from. Now the next risk when it comes to coal seam gas mining is methane. Now methane in what quantities is again a big unknown. Of a shale gas field, so another unconventional gas field in Colorado, figures show that you're losing about 4% of methane off the field itself. Methane, which is a highly flammable, explosive greenhouse gas. High Cap Energy's 2010 study of CSG technologies in Wyoming found that large amounts of methane come up in the produced water, on average 15% of total well yield. That's why we're seeing images of people who can light their drinking water or the groundwater coming up through their bore on fire because of the presence of methane in that water. Obviously, this poses enormous risks in terms of fire, enormous risks in terms of explosion and as a contaminant, um, but also methane is an incredibly potent, potent greenhouse gas. So up to 105 times um, greater contribution to global warming than carbon dioxide over a 20-year period. Now next, and incredibly importantly, and not talked about enough in New South Wales at this stage, is the industrial footprint of the industry. So what does it actually take to have a productive field that is one that is commercially viable? Well, you need wellheads. You need wellheads every 300 to 900 metres, all connected by roads, roads large enough to get big tankers in and out, and pipelines. In various uh, industry applications, you're looking at between one hectare and four hectares of land clearing per well. There's also an enormous amount of supporting infrastructure. So, well pads need to accommodate pumps, generators, compressors, vehicles, and storage ponds or tanks to hold produced water. And of course, with this industry, the kind of quantities of water they're talking about bringing out constantly, you're talking about ongoing heavy vehicle movement because water has to be transported to treatment, uh, reverse osmosis plants, liquefied natural gas conversion in terms of export, and this is predominantly looking at 83% to be an export industry. Uh, we need ships for export, ports for large ships, and just to finish on one note, because of course, this isn't just about the Illawarra, Right now, sections of the Living Great Barrier Reef are being drenched to get bigger ships in and out of Gladstone Port to export gas. Now next and importantly, again an under-researched area, coal seam gas mining, particularly hydraulic fracturing and re-injection of produced water has been linked to seismic activity. Now again, it almost goes without saying to begin with, hydraulic fracturing fractures underground systems. It creates a seismic event simply by doing it. The UK's only shale gas drilling project was suspended in 2011 after the British Geological Survey recorded two earthquakes within two kilometres of CS CSG exploration in Blackpool. They put a moratorium on hydraulic fracturing into the investigation. What they found was strong links to earthquakes when it came to hydraulic fracturing. The Arkansas Geological Survey and the Centre for Seismographic Information and Research at the University of Memphis conducted a study of thousands of earthquakes that have occurred in Faulkner County in Arkansas in the US. They found a strong temporal and spatial evidence for a relationship between these quakes and the injection wells. Seismic activity has almost ceased since the fracking stopped. Dr. David Oppenheimer, a seismologist with the US Ge Geological Survey, told Power Magazine that fracking could certainly generate seismic activity because that is how the hydraulic fractures are made. The journal's August 2009 issue reported that Dr. Christian Close, a geophysical hazards research scientist at Columbia University, said, the quake risk is intensified by hydrofracturing. Now to talk about the situation that we are in, this map might be quite a shock, 
Petroleum exploration licences are areas where companies are given permission to explore for coal seam gas. That's a picture of the Illawarra extending up to Sydney. You can see that petroleum exploration licences extend from Sanctuary Point in the south all the way right up and over the Sydney Basin. In terms of wells, at the moment we've got 16 approved, all in and around our drinking water catchment. So 11 of the 16 are in areas so protected that if I walk, I can be fined $11,000. Obviously risks when it comes to water, the evidenced toxic spills, enormous quantities of contaminated water we're dealing with, these pose particular risks to a drinking water catchment area. But in addition, we are an incredibly bushfire prone area, and you're talking about introducing more methane into that environment. And we are in, particularly with these wells, a geologically quite unstable area, which is already littered with coal mines. That's the area that we are talking about. Now my talk's actually divided into two parts, so I'll finish right now on this note. For all of these reasons, we launched the campaign locally. The reality is, still, not enough is known about these technologies. Yet at the same time, approvals have been given and drilling is continuing, despite the fact that more and more evidence comes to light and the industry is showing itself to operate unsafely. We call for a precautionary approach. That is, you need the facts, you need to know it's safe and under what conditions before you can do it. So we call for a freeze on the industry for a Royal Commission. That is the highest level of public inquiry because the public has the right to know the facts so that we can make a decision about whether or not and under what conditions CSG mining can go ahead. Finally and importantly, we call for a ban on fracking. A ban on fracking because no practice that fractures underground systems creates a seismic event and uses and contaminates enormous quantities of fresh water in a country prone to drought like Australia should be allowed to happen. Thank you.